Thank you, Alan. Um, I'm very excited to be here. And um, yeah, I define myself a designer, actually. But yeah, I also like the description that um, Alan gave me. So I hope that what I do is not too specific. I, I am a designer. I work with visuals, but I work with data. I don't know how much of data visualization you are uh, familiar with, but I'll try to be very, like, I don't know, simple in what I um, say. So just a little bit of information of me before I started. Um, I am an architect as a background, so I didn't study design, but I work as an information designer, so like building information and knowledge rather than houses. And in my day job, I um, work as a professional in the data world. I design charts, data visualization, and interfaces that in a way let people access data in a visual way. And I run a design firm that is called Accurate. Um, I co-founded the firm five years ago. We are around 20, 22 now, data visualization designers, software developers, and data analysts. We started out in Milan, Italy. I'm Italian. And then uh, two years ago, I moved here to start the New York office. And um, as you can imagine, we work across very different industries, creating different kind of data, data-driven digital products for business and communication purposes. This is just a pretty fast composition of some of our latest digital applications. So we do build a lot of visual analytics, which is a boring definition, but like we work with banks and organization in design and develop digital tools to leverage the data assets. Uh, recently, we also started to work around data strategy from a design perspective, so supporting the creation of data workflow before even visualizing the data. We also uh, work with startups, building uh, their data-driven mm, data product from the very concept to the development. And we also design multimedia data-driven experiences, so combining different media, such as video interviews and um, videos and data. But today, I just don't want to show you our work or our process. I'd rather like to start a conversation with you around what I believe are some of the key challenges for us as designers, especially communication designers and information designers nowadays. And what I believe could be interesting perspective to look at our data and the data visualization world from. So first of all, I think we should embrace complexity and think at our data projects in general as engaging ways to convey the richness of the data we analyze, the richness of the context um, of those data rather than simplification. Because the world is complex, it's compound, more and more rich of information than can be combined in these very handless ways. And more and more, um, given the increased complexity of the phenomenon that we analyze, like simple bar charts um, are not really able to communicate and render the complexity. And so I do believe that one of the important challenges for data visualization designers nowadays is to experiment and find proper ways to express the data complexity. Most of the times, all of that runs around designing layers of data explorations, and so layering both our analysis and the visualization. So overview first, zoom and filter, and details on demand, uh, says Ben Schneiderman. But how can we do that? So I'm going to show showing you today and now a not very recent project of ours, but I still think it's useful to be showcased because it was at Accurate our playground to find our way to address complexity. It's an old-fashioned uh, series of printed data visualization in collaboration with La Lettura, which is the Sunday cultural supplement of the main Italian newspaper, which is Corriere della Sera. It was a journalistic collaboration where we worked side by side with the newsroom of the newspaper for more than two years, and we produced more than 40 data analysis and visualization, and we sort of created um, our method to create rich and dense visual narratives with data. And in static pieces like that is, of course, even more challenging because you can't have interactivity like in a digital application, and so you, you really have to um, try to build these languages to address this complexity. So La Lettura is how the supplement is called, and it can be translated like the very act of reading, like spending time reading. And the purpose of the column where we publish the visualizations is explicitly to explore what can be done with data journalism and data visualization, and also to like, perform a sort of stress test, how much of a complexity a reader can absorb. And every time here, this is still in Italian, but then I'll show you uh, some translations in English. Um, every time here we chose our topic, we, sometimes it was just a fascina fascination that we have, sometimes it was a compelling hot topic that we wanted to explore. We found our own data sets um, to visualize. And then we also looked for multiple tangential data sets that can enrich and contextualize the main one that we found. 
And then we every time imagined and create a very unique and tailored visual models for the data that we were analyzing. And we call what we do here a multi-layered storytelling with a first story that should be visually clear at a glance, but then that can lead readers uh, get lost in details, in marginal possible exploration. And here it was when in our company we didn't have developers, and so everything that you see here has been done pretty manually from Excel to Adobe Illustrator, so no coding here, like a laborious process of working with the data. Um, I'll just explain you one of the visualization for the first idea around complexity. So this visualization explores the Nobel Prizes and laureates from 1901 to 2012. And the main data set that we found and that we have been working with um, contained only the names of the laureates, the categories of the prize, and the years they received the prize. But you will then see how we really enriched the visualization and the main data set because we wanted to look for a context uh, to our journalistic story. And we tried to layer the complexity to make it visually accessible. So we visualize the price categories along this timeline with this parallel score, with these main rows highlighted by colors, and so we will always have red for chemistry, blue for economic science, green for physics, yellow for literature, purple for medicine, and orange for peace. And each of the dots that you see here represents a Nobel laureate, and each guy is positioned according to the year the prize was awarded in this like horizontal axis, but also his or her age at the time of the award, which would easily calculate it given the date of birth. So highlighting how old you should be uh, to win a Nobel Prize. And then per each category, we drew a line indicating the average age for winning the prize per categories and also the average age for the total of the laureates. So starting to highlight differences between the different categories and the differences in ages through time. Then on the other part, we use the main axis of the visualization to provide some aggregated information. The arcs that you see here represent the principal university of affiliation of Nobel per each category. And so we took the total of the laureate, we picked the seven most common universities, and then we went to see how many of our geniuses attended those universities per category. And it's interesting to see that um, chemistry, which is red, physics, which is green, and medicine, which is purple, are spread, uh, quite spread among the seven main universities while literature in peace is Nobel laureates, which are yellow and orange, quite didn't attend the top university. Then this is even more interesting, those bar charts here within these brackets represent the average grade level per category, and so how many of the category, the, the, the category had a PhD or how many of these wasn't even degreed. And you can learn that if you want a Nobel in medicine or economic or physics, you should really think about a PhD, but you can try without it for literature and peace. Um, the double rounded dot um, represent the women out of the total, which are actually not so many. And our design choice is, here was pretty clear. We wanted to reduce the clutter visually, so we could have also added the double circles in blue, for example, around the men, uh, and painted them blue, but we didn't, because like, we, you got the distinction even if we only highlight uh, the women out of the total. Just going back a little bit um, on the whole piece before exploring the other parts so you can recall where we are. And you have to imagine that these pieces were printed like that big and so really people could physically dig into the data, like imagine a double page of the New York Times as a size. Then the part below represents the most frequent hometowns out of the total, called per categories and aggregated per 30 years. So again, um, using the already built axis of the visualization to provide this aggregated information. And yeah, interesting is that like lately, if you're born in the US, you're more likely to catch the prize, while at the beginning of last century that most of the scene was European. And so I guess you're starting to see how many contextual information we added to the first data set to suggest possible interpretations. We also had some curiosity highlighted, uh, so some primates and particularly relevant stories like, for example, Marie Curie winning two Nobel Prizes, or the oldest winner that was 90, while the youngest was 24, like personal stories that are then recalled in the visualization with the number to show that these are like human beings, you know, behind the dots. And of course, this is the how to read it part when we used, again, the visualization main shape to give readers information on how to play around with our designs. And this is very important, like to build a very consistent legend, especially when you are dealing with so many layers of information. 
So here we are back again with the whole structure of the piece, which is quite rich and it renders the complexity of the many overlapping and interplayable stories around the Nobel Prizes. And this is not the ultimate point of view um, around uh, the Nobel Prizes, but like as a journalist here, at least we provided multiple um, levels for readers to explore. So I explained how we normally work with these many layers of information in a paper I've been asked to write for the Parsons Journal for Information Mapping. And so we realized while writing this paper that there are really different phases of layering both our analysis and the data visually that we normally follow. Um, the process is of course not so linear as I will be telling you right now. It's a constant iteration and seeing if it works and like coming back and forth. But if I should you know, start to um, yeah, I like to talk about phases. I would say that first of all, we always compose the main architecture of the visualization, the basis through which the main story will be mapped and displayed. And so is it a timeline, a scatter plot, is it a map? Is the organization of the layout of the visualization. And then we start positioning singular elements within the main frameworks. So each singular data point finds its location within it. And these are of course diagram and like abstract diagrams. So it's not a real visualization, it's just to explain you the phases. Um, and yeah, this is also the process where we test the effectiveness of the main architecture of the visualization. So the placement of the elements reveals if there are weaknesses in our models and we have to maybe design a different one. Then we construct shaped elements of dimensionality and form with quantitative and qualitative parameters. And so each element starts to assume a color, a feature, um, according to the characteristic that we want to highlight. Then if there are uh, internal relationship between the element, then we start to elucidate this um, relationship. And then we start labeling and identifying. So the addition of explanatory labels and short text to provide, to start to provide clarity uh, throughout the visualization and to identify our elements. And then this is the main point, like after we know that the first story has been told, we are starting to supplement the greatest story through the addition of minor or tangential tales elements. And we consider it a very important um, step to contextualize the phenomena. And as we've seen before uh, with the nobles, we can consider this part as linking the main story to external ideas to other times or other places. And the element of what I call a secondary story, of course, should be positioned where they best help to enrich the overall comprehension, where they fit into the data. Like, for example, where before we used the main axis of the visualization to then aggregate the information. And then, of course, providing small visual explanations such as a legend or a key. Um, and the process of the legend, creating the legend, always like involves a simplification of the general architecture, for example, the X and the Y axis, like base, timeline, or a scatterplot, as well as like minimal explicit shape, colors, and dimension of the singular elements. And in the end, fine-tuning and stylizing the elements. And this is very, very important when we have so many layers. So we really have to work on, like you see before, really to make the most important like information pop out. And here we really work with opacity of layers, with like thickness of line, something very small and probably that not always the readers can really, can really know that you're doing, but it's very, very important for the overall. Um, it really makes a difference on how readers perceive the piece. And again, this is not linear as it could seem. Um, it's a constant iteration of explorations. And we made no claim to have created the universal method to layer complexity, but in general, I do believe that it's really important to keep on exploring around that. Um, another challenge, or let's say approach, that guides my personal work is the chase for beauty because we know that design and aesthetics has a very um, deep role in how users perceive every kind of product, which it could be a product, but also a piece of information. And I do believe that a pure, beautiful visual can be a trigger, to, an extremely powerful trigger to get people curious and willing to explore uh, the content of the data analysis that you performed. And this is why I think that in certain cases, the aesthetic aspect of a data visualization can be considered as important as the data itself to catch readers' attention, to make them willing to dig into the topic and to trigger their curiosity to explore more. And like why a reader shouldn't be able to find a data visualization both intellectually compelling and so very rigorous data-wise, but also emotionally rich. And I really like that sentence. And where I want to go with it, of course, is that 
beauty cannot replace functionality, but beauty and functionality together achieve incredibly greater results. And this is why we like at Accurate and why I like the idea of making people think, oh, this is beautiful and maybe even strange in the first place, but then hopefully I want to know what it is about. But again, how can we do that? Uh, I'm just sharing my personal uh, way and method of chasing beauty. Um, what I try to do when I build data visualization is never get inspiration from existing data visualization. I'd rather get visually inspired from various fields and I always suggest others to try. I suggest that as designer we should learn how to see before learning how to design and to learn what is that we like of what we see, what are the features of the things that we naturally attract our eyes. Personally, I'm very, very attracted by um, abstract art for the elegance of the composition and the juxtaposition of different elements, but also from the repetitive aesthetics of music not notation, for example, or the layering system of architectural drawing. And I really think that it's important to observe and then to be able to translate the features that your eyes are attracted by um, to core principle of our personal style. And you will see what I mean with the next visualization that I'm showing. This is still part of our collaboration with Alettura. Uh, then I'll move, to, I'll move on to show you different projects. And it's a data narrative that took a very, very deep visual inspiration. And I will explain the visualization pretty quickly and then I'll get to the core of my point. Um, this visualization explored the phenomenon of the brain drain, so researchers that decides to move abroad in another country to pursue their research career. And it is explored through a visualization that displays the main income and outcome of researchers' flow on 16 countries and discovering, color, again, correlation with other parameters. And as in the Nobel Prize, we combine very many data sets. And again, you have to imagine that these were like print pretty big, so I know that the screen, unfortunately, it doesn't really make good to this visualization. So the main architecture of the visualization, the countries here are positioned uh, with mm, contrasting two parameters. And so horizontally, the GDP that each country dedicates for the research and development field, and vertically, the number of researchers per million people. So the very first point of view uh, of the story, you have it with the positioning of the country and seeing how they are already performing quite um, differently. And then each country is displaying by contrasting a lot of information that helps discover its situation in terms of how many researchers go abroad, which is the solid histogram going down, the red solid histogram going down, how many, how many enter the country, which is the blue solid histogram going up, and also how many are coming back after a period abroad, which is the orange thin bar. But also we wanted to add many more information to understand what's happening in the country. And so we included data about the regular populations, emigration and immigration with the red and blue hollowed um, histograms following the main one, the GDP per capita, the unemployment rate, the university rankings, and also an interesting parameter that we found that is the female employment rate with the pink, um, with the pink bar. And we've been spending a lot of time understanding the data, finding the most proper data set to combine. And there were many, many possibilities for how to visualize the data, knowing where the patterns were. But actually the visual idea for the piece came to me after a visit to the MoMA's Inventing Abstraction exhibition, which was very fascinating in 2013, I guess, which happened during the first day that we were analyzing the data that we had found on the researchers and countries. And I was looking like already in my mind to a visual way to correlate these many parameters by researchers per country. And while walking past Mondrian, Malovich or Kandinsky's art pieces, I started to envision each country as a compound element. The parameters of the element um, could have been visually related by the positioning, the rotation and the spatial correlation of those geometrical shapes that I was kind of like sketching down during my visit. And consequently, we normalized the number, so we represented each value as a function of the country's population. Thus, in the visualization that you see, we are displaying relative percentages to let readers visually compare the relevant information, which happen to be much more interesting than the values per se, so the actual numbers. And there are a lot of patterns that visually emerge. So for example, you can see from the piece in general that researchers move around much more than the average person because for each country, the red and blue solid histogram, which are the researchers, are always longer than the hollowed ones. But we have some exception, like in leading countries like Spain and Italy. In fact, they import proportionally more regular workers, so say with a lower level of education rather than researchers. 
and many, many more other findings that one can dip into. But this is not the point today. I guess that visually you can totally say that um, you know, the modern painting visual uh, reference played its, its role on the piece and how it helped not only creating a visually unconventional and unexpected pace, but also informing the choices that we made on how about telling the story. And I want to stress this point around aesthetics because to be communication designer, information designer, and so like most of all data visualization designers, you have to find new ways to attract people's attention, even like through new languages and new solutions that besides being functional, accurate and appropriate, they also must be magnetic and surprising in a way. And I believe again, that learning how to see is really essential to learn how to design. And learning how to see means really again, asking yourself what is that you like of what you see. And it means building your visual vocabulary. Which leads me to the next point, which is try to not limit to standards when we can. As you probably have seen the visualization that I've showed you before, the visuals that we produce with data are not really standard, are not really something that you can get out of an Excel or out of a tool that can create a visualization for you. They do rely on standards like timeline, bar charts, or scatterplot, but they are not limited to that. And also, as you've seen, I sketch with data a lot. When I work on any kind of data visualization project, I produce tons of sketches, even before pulling the data into any sort of tool that can return me to a draft chart. I sketch to understand how to spatially organize the data, to define both the architecture of the composition and the visual aspect of the tiny details, and why I think this is a valuable approach. <coughs> Specifically in data visualization, one of the most common approach is to start from what the tools that you use can provide you with like even like processing Tableau or the basic Excel graph from what the tools can really return you or also maybe from what we feel more comfortable in doing with these tools. But when we sketch with data and designing data visualization, like sketching with data what comes into mind and the fact that I can't in a way have data on my pen and on my paper, it's very helpful to explore visual features and visual aggregation that really comes exactly from what you have in mind after, of course, you analyze the data itself. And I really see that as a shortcut from your head to the final piece. And talking about data and sketching with data, I've been asked an interesting question by Mordis Stefaner um, in his Data Stories podcast that um, I will invite you to check out because he always have amazing guests, so it's called Data Stories. So he basically asked me, okay, George, but how about the real data? Like you search sketch possibilities, but like when do the actual data um, come to the table? And I would sum up again here by saying that there are about three phases, three phases that in parallel of the data analysis um, are helping me draft the visualizations with the sketches. So a first phase when I am interested in say the main macro categories of data, like the kind of topics we are talking about, the eventual correlations of pattern that we find, or even just the number of elements. Are we talking about 50 entries or 500, 5,000? So understanding the macro categories to start the visual possibilities about the macro organization, again, the architecture of visualization. And then there's a second phase where after we test our designs with the actual data, after we see that the special layout works, uh, I would just like focus on the singular element, so the singular entry point. I would sketch and re-sketch shapes and details to figure out um, which features to use to better represent them according to the variables that we have. And to conclude, I would generally have a final phase where I would structure everything that I expect of finally having digital, but in paper. And here is again when I'm pretty sure that we can go ahead with the design that we created. And this is um, just the, the final piece that we've been uh, doing for the, before the sketches. And I think that it's very important also to have like refined sketches to have something that is very shareable with clients. I always like to share sketches with clients in the first phases as opposed to wireframes because I realize that most of the clients take what you do digitally, even if you write dra like draft right in caps, like they take it as more final as a sketch. And so there's less room for a discussion if you just share a wireframe than if you share a sketch. So they also get more defensive in general with wireframes and yeah, so I mean, sketch is good. Then another thing that I would like to talk about today that it might seem obvious but it's worth saying out loud is that we should always take into consideration what data stands for, what numbers actually represent in their context and keep it, this in mind always at, various, at every stage of every project. 
And in my profession, I really realized that when it comes to data, a common approach is to throw technology at the problem, like sometimes without even spending enough time framing the real issues and the real challenge. Like, we have big data, we should use Hadoop or Spark or whatever. This is really something that I hear a lot from my clients. But these are just instruments. And over the last year, a lot have been done um, in research around what technology can bring to the data world, and this is amazing. But I do believe that it's the true convergence and hybridizations of science and design that can open new perspective and take the conversation to a next level. Because when we work with information, it's really so easy to get fascinated by the quantities, the number, the variables, and it's really easy to lose track of what numbers really mean and what it's important to display. And yeah, with my company, we do work with businesses and organizations of different nature, and for them, we do build software custom analytic platforms, we do really experiment with different kind of technology, but we also have every time try to look at any of their data problem using a design approach from the very early stage. Very early stage. A design approach that actually limits the possibilities to increase the opportunities, to focus on framing the right questions and ultimately to reconnect numbers to what they stand for, which is people and behaviors. And to disregard, last year a very particular challenge was posed to my team by this woman, Samantha Cristoforetti. She has been the first Italian woman astronaut. And, well, yeah, of course I'm Italian, so it's easy to <laughs> talk about Italian projects. Um, so she contacted us before being launched on a six-month-long expedition to the International Space Station. And she asked us if we wanted to collaborate on some real-time data visualization while she would be in space. How awesome, like how much data there will be to visualize, like the orbit around Earth, the number of spacewalk, or the, you know, the speed and positioning of the ISS, or also her Twitter feed, because she could tweet from up there, visualize on a map. And I could really go on hours to list how many information there are available to visualize, but a technology-driven approach would have taken us far from anything meaningful. This is exactly what we didn't want to do, and actually, like, who needs that? But still, we're so compelled to use all of the numbers we have, the complex to show the power and the complexity of our engine, to display everything that we analyze all together. But ultimately, what Samantha, what both Samantha and, and I and us wanted to achieve was a way to make her presence felt through her data, a way to remind people um, down here on Earth that there was a human being orbiting around them um, on like beyond Earth, a human being who was trying to find ways to communicate with them. And so we decided to frame just one question to guide our design process. Is it possible to use this data to promote a very simple and basic human connection? And if you think about it, the idea was there already. In fact, the core idea of Friends in Space, which we like to describe as the first social network that extends beyond Earth, is very simple. You log in with your social profile. Here is me. You can see Samantha's real-time position above your head with the trajectory of her current orbit, which is the yellow, um, the yellow arc, as well as a map of all of the people around the world that are online in the same moment with you in the platform. Well, yeah, it might take you a few seconds bef before you realize that those little symbols indicate all of the people that right now are online with you on Friends in Space, represented through their location on a world map that you can hide and show. But as soon as you realize that one of these little dots is you, the fun begins. So you just click hello and a simple arc on the map connects you to other people who just say hello from all over the world. You're linked, you're connected with somebody in Japan, in New Zealand. Um, and actually you see it, you see it on the map and you feel that. And the whole idea is very simple, is that you are part of a map of the world that is connecting different people who at least uh, share one uh, interest and one emotion. And if you were lucky enough, you also saw and received a feedback from Samantha when she was waving back from the ISS because every day she like tweeted a low earth with an hashtag that we retrieved and specifically from her position we just like got the feedback to the people that were connected. And all of this connection have then been recorded for you in your control room in form of like visual souvenirs from space. So you see that data powers all of this. In fact, then a very simple human interaction, um, like the way of connecting um, people drives all of the experience. And you can see that we really limited the interaction by design. We wanted to play with the simplicity of the gesture of waving and saying hello from where you are to other places. 
And it, the response of people was incredible. Really, through Friends in Space, tens of thousands of people connected with Samantha and between themselves. And the very positive response really taught me a very important lesson. That was what I was telling to you in the beginning, that limitations with data are the true way to, in a way, transform the abstract and the uncountable um, into something that can be seen, felt, and reconnected to our lives and to our behaviors. This is my last one, um, my last point, very connected to the previous one, which explored limitation. And um, I'd like now to talk to you about how we can use data to become more human, to connect with ourselves and with other at the deeper level, and to advocate that this is totally possible. So the last experience um, is definitely more radical in terms of using limitations as an asset. And for me, it was the big data hangover relief. It's a zero technological year long, very laborious personal project uh, that consumed like, I guess, all of my evenings and, and, and weekends uh, for the last year. It was a collaboration with information designer Stephanie Pozovic. I am an Italian and I live in New York. She is an American and she lives in London. We only met a few times in our life, but last year we decided to work together because we found that we have many personal and work similarities. We're both the same age, expats in our 30s, so both only children struggling with being so far from our family. We both work with data in a very handcrafted way, so trying to add a human touch to the world of computing and algorithms. And most of all, we are both obsessed with drawing with data and with sketching data. So we decided to challenge ourselves. We would get to know each other through our data and through our drawing, of course, drawing with data. And we conceived and started what we call Dear Data, a sort of like uncommon kind of correspondence of hand-drawn data postcards across the ocean. So each week since September um, 1st, 2014, and for a year, we collected our personal data around a shared topic, from our complaints to the interaction with our partners, from the compliments we received to the sounds of our surrounding, from the negative thoughts for the week as they popped up to our obsession and habits. 52 pretexts in form of data to investigate and reveal a particular aspect to ourselves, to the other person, of ourselves, um, and about our days to the other person. At the end of the week, we then take, we would take the time to analyze our information and to create an hand-drawn correspondence to each other. So unfolded data postcard that we would send from New York to London and from London to New York for 52 weeks. Eventually, the postcards arrived at the other person's address with all of the scuff marks of his journey through the ocean with this third party um, and the project being the postal service. So we purposely designed initial constraints for the for the postcards and for the project to form a consistent collection, but also to allow us experimenting more with our weekly data. So the front of the postcards is always um, the data drawing. It contains no explanation at all, and it's hopefully beautiful drawing that one could only take as an illustration if you didn't know that there is data behind. And the back of the postcards contains, of course, the address of the other person, the title of the project and of the week, and the legend, so how to read our data drawings. And it's interesting that we didn't send each other any digital scans of our postcards, so we have both been eagerly waiting to get the, the data weekly portrait of the other person in the mailbox for a year. Also, like, we're discovering the pleasure of checking the postbox as you get home. And it has really been a, sort, a type of slow data, small data, and analog data transmission. So, well, yeah, during a time when everybody's talking about big data, virtual reality, we, of course, do small data and physical postcards, you know? It, it doesn't sound revolutionary, but by removing technology but from the equation, we were really forced to extend ourselves as designers. Because from the one hand, we have each been forced to invent 52 different visual languages because hand drawing with data leads to design that are, of course, incredibly customized to the data that you're working with. But also by removing, like removing technology from the equation triggered us to find different ways to look at data as excuses to tell something about ourselves. In fact, as we gathered our weekly data, the process was definitely more labor intensive than just deriving standard metric from our technological devices. We like to call Dear Data more a personal documentary than a quantified self project because we didn't hear only quantified numbers, but we have been adding qualitative detail to our data collection, and that was really the most important part for us. For example, the very first week of Dear Data, which is a pretty cold and impersonal topic, how many times do we check the time in a week? 
And so here at the front of my postcards, and you can see that every little symbol represents all of the time I check the time, order per days, per hour, chronologically, nothing complicated. But you also see how I added anecdotal details about those moments. In fact, the very different instances of my symbols indicate why I was checking the time. What was I doing? Was I bored? Was I hungry? Was I late? Did I just like glance the clock without really wanting to do that? And this is the key part. So giving Stephanie or the other person an idea of my days to the pretext of my data collection. Something that is not really possible if you don't actively add meaning to your tracking. Of course, a lot of us work with their personal data. We all have many apps that are supposed to unlock key revelation about ourselves and about patterns in our life. But I think we shouldn't really expect an, a, techno, a digital app to tell something about ourselves without any active effort by us. We really have to engage in sense making of our own data. And like, most of the weeks of our Dear Data project, the topics were something that a digital app cannot track uh, and that you really have to engage in because, of course, we can also find data in our minds and in the words we use and not only in our activities, which is even more compelling if the goal is telling something about ourselves um, through our data. On week seven, we tracked our complaints and I composed this musical complaints card, borrowing a very literal visual inspiration from the music notation system to show the repetitiveness of my complaints of different type over time and their pitch, their loudness, through the positioning of my complaints notes over the lines of each score. Did I truly need to complain? And explaining Stephanie um, how to interpret my protest and being very honest about how grumpy I've been in the true spirit of sharing and then also using my data drawing as a further data set, sort of like realizing that the real data drawing could have been pretty simple, but you see what I mean, like, anyway, like admissible complaint, not really so many. And I really invite you to count every time that you complain because you realize that most of the time it makes no sense to do that. But then because we wanted to experiment, we figured that we can find data even beyond the daily tracking and make a survey of what we own, for example going to our wardrobes uh, with the eyes of the data collector, looking for data in the way we categorize or classify our garments, how many do we own, what colors, how often do we wear them, do we really need all of the clothes that we have. And again, for me, discovering what should have been pretty clear from the beginning <laughs> from the overall story of my closet. Um, but when you see that visualized, you really see, oh my God, really, re really that is true. And you see that and it really jumps at you. Or at week 46, we categorize the books we own, or we explore our emotions, track the darkest feelings of our negative thoughts for a week, which was quite difficult to do and made us realize how complicated it is to really discern um, what makes you feel bad and what darkens your mind. It's really hard to um, make these things countable, but we tried. We also tracked our laughter for a week, like what we did laugh about and with whom. And this is one of those data set that in a way intrudes in our life because you can't fully enjoy your laughter because you know that you have to track it. So it's kind of like, it, it was a really a tricky year. Or, or lastly, we can also try to use data to become better human beings, at least for a week, and to be able to perform X, like to perform X to then be able to track them. Like this week where we purposely smile to strangers and track their reaction, if there was any reaction. So I'm not going to show you all of our postcards. You can find them online. Um, but what I wanted to say with that is that over a year, Stephanie and I shared everything about ourselves through the excuses of our data. We truly became friends through our data. And most importantly, we also started to look at data in our profession through different lenses. I'm not suggesting you to start drawing your personal data or to find a pimple across the ocean, even though actually, if you want to do it, now we have an open section of our website where you can find a data pimple and it's already full of people who are participating from all around the world. Um, but anyway, it's of course not imaginable that we all like hand-drawn data in our jobs and thank God we have our computers and our softwares, but Experimentation of this kind where we radically limit ourselves and when we drastically limit our tools and our possibilities can really teach us a lot about um, the perspective that we look at all kind of data from. Because by shifting away the focus from the technology, we get closer to the real meaning and then we can definitely bring technology back in the process. And yeah, it's painful. It was painful, laborious, frustrating, and it made you realize that the undo comment is really amazing because here you can't undo. It's painful when the postcard is coming up very nicely and then you have to 
start from scratch because you make a mistake. But there is a value in spending time with your data. And in this specific project, since it was a process of discovery about ourselves by hand counting and by hand analyzing, you know, analyzing our data manually, we really got to know ourselves and the other person um, at a deeper level. And maybe what I'm saying is also that we have to spend more time with our data in general. Because if you think about it, even when we work with big data, like the whole point is making it meaningful, contextual. It's about making it smarter, understandable, and actually smaller. So for sure, data is not only a matter of technology, as I was like introducing before. It's mostly a matter of how we collect, process, and relate with information. It's a matter of how we design uh, the ways to look at data. And this is why I like to say that I believe that data is more a state of mind and that data can be an attitude more than a matter of skills and tools and that we can really find data all around us and, and become collector in our days if we just put on um, the right glasses. On a more personal level, I also discovered how putting myself into a project and making very personal information public, not only to Stephanie, but like to all of the people that, that saw the website, um, well, it really kind of like not only deep, deeply deeper and deeply connected with Stephanie, but also to hundreds of people that are taking the time to write us and to say how much they can relate to a specific topic, to a specific revelation. Because if you think about it, in each postcard for 52 weeks, we manifested our flubs, our geeky habits, uh, geeky sides and habits, and we definitely didn't share our best selves as we sometimes would do on social media. We shared who we truly are and doing it in form of tiny quantitative bits honestly also helps you not being afraid of doing that. They are data after all. So I mean ultimately I argue that data can make us more human um, and connect with ourselves and other at a deeper level if we design the right ways to do that. I'm almost done. Um, more in general one year of this very laborious personal project with data, one year of what I call unnecessary creating uh, really led me to think about my work and profession in a different way. It also led to uh, amazing stuff like the forthcoming publication of a book, various exhibitions, and it has been really a great learning experience even um, almost like seven years of professional work around the field. And I'm also happy to say that it made me reflect upon collaboration and it's not, it has not been easy at all. Um, we definitely get on each other nerves many times. We are two strong-minded designers with different design sensibilities and they, they have been and there are so many design battles around how to communicate the project, how to shape the website, how to compose our talks, but also like let alone how to like design a book together that we're doing it right now. But with two of us, we've also been able to stick to this project through holding each other accountable, pushing each other forward every week. And we have been able to progress in our practice in a way that we could never have ever done on our own. And think about it, if in your collaboration you agree on everything, the other person is not necessary. And like, I would, you know, I, I think it's important to always keep it in mind when in any kind of professional relationship, you just desperately want your ideas to win. But you don't learn this way, you don't grow this way, and you don't make big steps this way, I believe. Um, I guess I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was Thank fantastic. <laughs> just like so much to absorb and to process. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about something you touched on earlier in your talk, where you talked about data strategy before mm -hmm. design, and you know, creating data processes before designing the yeah. data itself. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, it's something that we started to do lately um, because the more we work with big organization and with organization that have many different kind of department within their business that work with data, we really understand that sometimes it's the, the reason why they are not optimizing their work with data, it's also really a lack of communication workflow, a lack of really a workflow for the data. Sometimes, often, very often, you have the data analysts that just like analyze their data, and then you have the developers that build the back end, and then you have a visual designer that ultimately sometimes they kind of like call in the process, but the, the most of the data analysis and the data structure has already been done. So what we are trying to do with some organization that we're working with is really to talk to them from the beginning to the end of the process to try to start 
like collaborating on like analyzing data before really you know compartmentalizing everything. So what we're doing with different kind of organizations, specifically financial institutions, is really trying to bake the design into the beginning of the process. You need to be lucky to find a uh, client that is willing to change their workflow and the biggest the organization is the hardest is to convince them. Uh, but I think there is value to that because otherwise really having this very, very com compartim compartmentalized, can you say that? Compartmentalized um, ways of working with data, it brings you, I think, far away from meaningful solution that last in the long term. It really, you know, you, you do your work with data, but then you don't really get into any kind of innovation uh, part. I'm, I'm not a data strategist. I, we have a data strategist in our company because my partner is a sociologist and have been studying a lot of like data strategies. So it's definitely he, him um, responsible to do that. But I enjoy being part of that as a designer. <laughs> sure. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for giving us your time. I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Um, I, I've heard that Jerry Sorp talked about how um, data, people working on data can be categorized in three different um, hmm. like sections, design, designers, artists, and yeah. scientists. Yeah. And um, when my thesis was on data mm -hmm. visualization and when I was interviewing people, I realized that there's always like this battle between scientists and designers or artists that mm -hmm. um, they criticize them for the lack of accuracy with their visualizations. How do you um, yeah. handle these kind of situations? How do you? I think that like it's also mostly a matter of definitions and goals. There are so many infinite posts online between the differences between data art and data visualization, data design and something. Ultimately, I believe that it depends on the goal that you have on hand. So what is your communication goal that you have with data? What I personally find interesting, and this is also why I don't work by myself, but I work with a team, is having a group of people that comes from different backgrounds and they can really tackle data from like 360 degrees. So in my company, we have data scientists, data analysts, we have this sociologist partner of mine that works with data strategies. We have interaction designers and data visualization designers. And so I think that depending on the goals, the best thing possible is to have different voices in the process. But I'm not sure if I answered to your question. So what is specifically your question about that? What if I told you that your visualization is a piece of art, but it's not informative. Like I'm not, it's not accurate. Like your numbers aren't actually, your visualization doesn't actually um, represent the true numbers. Well, this is a matter so it's of like misleading. going back and it's check. Misleading. Well, if you do make mistake with data and like misrepresent the information, this is something that you're not supposed to do. And this is something that is wrong in all of kind of practice as if you were a journalist and you tell a story that is not true. So I think that what I say, what I think in my work is that accuracy with data is granted, like it's the base level. We shouldn't even talk about accuracy. Like this is right. really something that we should give for granted. And if you make a mistake and you misrepresent information, you're not doing your job correctly. But like I think that on top of that, you have some goals. If you're working with data for decision-making purposes, for sure you're not building these rich and dense visual narratives because you need to have people focus on the right information immediately. And maybe you're building a very simple dashboard. That is something that people can really uh, understand at a glance, but if you're telling, for example, a journalistic story, and if you're purposely experimenting, I think there is more room to say, okay, we combine this kind of information that maybe are not the ultimate point of view on the Nobel Prize's history or the brain drain researchers, but this is a piece of journalism, and like every kind of journalist, you have an interpretation of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we can, we can talk hours on yeah. that. Yeah. It's, um, so, but Jer, I, I didn't, I mean, I know Jer very well. I didn't, um, yeah, I, I didn't his read tweet. his piece. Sorry? Oh, I saw his tweet to the lady. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, um, but I didn't know that he was categorized in designer, artist, and data scientist. Probably is because of the scope that they have. Um, I think that data art, to me, data art is a subset of data design, data visualization design. Um, 
but it's really... I think that layer of abstraction kind of takes away from what they call, scientists call accuracy. Um, mm. And that creates like that. To me, accuracy working. is just not misrepresent the information and not really misrepresent the numbers because like everything that you saw before is really accurate. Like the numbers are placed in the exact same position according to the years or the numbers or the values. We can say that it's like complicated, that it's rich, that it's too rich probably, but we can say that it's not accurate. And if it's not accurate, it's because we made a mistake, but it's not that. I mean, what I'm saying, like accuracy should yeah. always be there. And then we can talk about what is the goal for your visualization. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Oh, Wait. Oh, okay. Uh, you mentioned that data can make us more human. Mm -hmm. So what's the definition of human? It's like, I'm thinking data makes us think more rationally, um, but I think human has some emotional thinking, so I'm not sure the definition of human here. Yeah, well, the definition of human to me is, what, what I was saying when I'm saying that data can make us more human is what I then wrote as a tagline, like to connect with ourselves at a deeper level. Of course, it's a sort of provocation because something that you say, well, data and human, but what the Dear Data project proved to me, for example, I'm not a person that have ever been able to do meditation or to go to any therapy because of how I am, but like you're really focusing and acknowledging a topic in form of data helped me understand a lot of things about myself for over a year. So I'm saying that sometimes quantifying or giving yourself the excuse, the pretext and the goal of starting by quantifying something around yourself and your inner self give you the real pretext to do stuff that maybe you wouldn't do before. So for example, there has been like in these 52 weeks, a lot of topics that I wouldn't have been able to address, like how much, for example, how undecided I am am I in like my general situation. I sort of, I think of myself as a very dec decisive person, but like a week of indecision, like really made me realize that I'm not for the most trivial parts of like negative thoughts. When you're really trying to discern what's going on in your mind, when you feel that there's something wrong, but then you have to do that because it's an exercise and you have to put it in form of data. What I'm saying is that data can be a tool to help us, not definitely not the only tool. It can be one of the many, many tools that we can have to get to connect with ourselves at a deeper level. That is why. Maybe human is not the best word that I can use, but I think that I'd like to talk about a possibility for the future to, you know, think about it at a humanism rather than a data, I don't know, technological only driven approach. It was of course a provocation, so thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I guess I was I was wondering how diverse a range of like industries do you work in through your clients, and then if you're working with a client who's from an industry that you don't have that much uh, personal experience in, how do you uh, how do you develop the insights into like what is the right question to ask yeah. when you're dealing with something that's like very unfamiliar? Yeah, definitely an interesting question. Um, we work with a lot of different industries. We work a lot with banks, so financial institutions. We've been working with the healthcare system. We work with foundations. We've been working with the UN, so the United Nations building their uh, reports. Um, so really with a lot of startups, and so startups that are definitely focused on different aspects. And what we do, because we are not expert in the domain field, we always set up with our clients a very first phase where we dig deep into the topic. And we always, always make sure that throughout all of the process, we work with one of our clients, like somebody within the team of our clients that is expert in their domain, because we can't like fake or pretend that we are the most expert in healthcare. We are expert in designing the ways information would be perceived. And um, so what we do is we always, always, always collaborate very strictly, like in a strict relationship with the core mm, knowledge domain of our clients. And for that, we every time that we have a, process, a project, we start with a 
two days of kickoff meeting, like work two day workshop with the client, and then we also have very um, Mm, often moments of feedback so we really kind of like talk not only every day not not necessarily every day but every couple of days and we send draft and then all of the process is very iterative but what I, I think that my the answer to your question is we don't even pretend to become more expert than our clients we are expert in our job which is how to visualize information how to make this information accessible but we do really work with um, expert and this is actually also why I love my job is because like every time and in every project I learn a lot of some I mean I, I really learn something new and I kind of like can dig deep into a different um, aspect or field. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Leila. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if if you have any, any example or story of some of like the um, of how some of your work has influenced or provoked changes in the in the industries that you were working for, yeah. And um, the the reason why I'm asking this is uh, I sometimes help my boyfriends in a, a urban design program and has doing a lot of trying to big data and mm -hmm. data visualization and a lot of the feedback that he gets is like okay data and then what. And like what, and I I think I understand why it, but that he gets that feedback so often is something that I find yeah. Really um, the first story that mm, I uh, it comes to mind is we are working a lot with an Italian bank, Unicredit Group is a European uh, kind of like pretty big bank, and for them we've been building an HR um, monitoring tool, yeah. and so a visual, a sort of like interactive tool when they can monitor the state of the the state of the art of the people, like their managers, their agents, then how much they do deliver what they are expected to deliver, how much time they do spend in meetings. So sort of like a huge gun that put together not only a timeline, but also like singular people. And like really they understand, and it's also like connected to LinkedIn. So it's sort of like uh, also helps them understand what are the skills of the people. And I remember that I was sitting there with one of my clients when he was like looking at a prototype and he realized that they were completely not covered into one of the core areas of what was one of their goals for the previous year. And so then it, it was just like, really, are we doing that? And he kind of like called the people and from that they started a conversation on how to optimize a specific part of their um, big kind of like company that they just weren't able to monitor at a higher level. So I think that the most insightful, um, the mo how, how to put it, like the, the times that I found our tools being more useful is when we give these tools to the top managers that normally they don't have access to data because they can't. I mean, they can't really read the data and they don't really have a lot of time to just like dig deep. They rely on the people that are below them in hierarchy to, you know, say that everything is going okay. And like, it happens a couple of other times that because of these kind of tools, they sort of like changed um, their process of optimization of resources. So just to make it a little more abstract, maybe when you give access to data to people that are able and empowered of taking decision, but they didn't really have access to data before, I think it's there that you can advocate that there will be a, um, a sort of change. And of course you can have like the person that is below you that gives you a PowerPoint with some numbers, but when you're really able to just like play with a visual tool, that's something that you're not required to be a programmer, and just like look at the data yourself, I think that there some discoveries might happen. It might not happen, but <laughs> if there's something wrong, hopefully it will pop up. So many questions, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, Ara. First of all, thank you so much for coming here thank and you. sharing your amazing work with all of us. It was very inspirational. Thanks. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, what, was a, what, was a, what was a big step that you took to actually co-found your mm -hmm. own uh, company? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is, 
Uh, have you ever, uh, do you have like really scientific data that has to be translated into informational graphics or have you ever had any like abstract data that has to be translated into informational graphics? What do you mean by abstract data? And then I will answer to your so questions. Not, so in like very unusual topics mm -hmm. that are, are not so scientific and straight to the point, does it make oh. sense? Um, I'm not sure if I got okay. the um, question. Your data, like all the topics of your data would OK, so something that you have to find your data. Exactly. OK, so starting from a topic. Yeah, I guess like dear data is the perfect. I'm sorry if I didn't uh, get the question. Um, I think that dear data is the perfect example to say, OK, you have to address your complaints. You have multiple ways to do that. Just like, for example, just tracking down every time that you complain and just it. But then you can really be creative and find ways to say, okay, but what is that I was complaining about? Who I was complaining it with? Or maybe putting also some contextual details. For example, I am a very, normally I'm a person that I'm always cold. And so maybe if I say that, okay, there was cold in this, it was cold in this place and I complain, I have a contextual detail. So for example, if I'm tracking my emotions, I can just say, okay, I felt an emotion, one, two, three, or then I can say what kind of emotion it was, what was it triggered by, or can I add contextual details, for example, about the weather, uh, I don't know, something that helps you discover. So I guess that when you have abstract topics, you can either, when, when it deals with your personal data, of course, you just have to be creative and find the right question, right, to ask to the topic and like the right way to put a abstract topic into quantities. But in our job, like in my company, when they say like, okay, for example, in this piece is for the Nobel laureates. Oh yeah, it's the anniversary of the Nobel laureates. Can you guys do something around that? And then we start to say, that's okay. What are the informations that are available? And then we went to find the main data set, which was just like how, when, the, when the Nobel prizes were delivered. And then starting by that, okay, but what can we add? And then you go and dig deep and find online and in different kind of like online databases uh, your data. So that's the second question. But like for the company, mm, I studied architecture, but like within all of my five years, I was more interested in the representation of like buildings that in the design of buildings and my, um, yeah, I'm trying to make it short. Uh, my last, my master thesis was an urban mapping project. And so it was like, like, of course, in the realm of architecture because I was dealing with the city, but I was like already mapping information. And after that, I uh, went to work for an interaction design firm. And there I met one of my um, two partners, the one that is like a sociologist. And like within this interaction design firm, it was a big firm in Italy, like 40 people, it's called Interaction Design Lab. My partner, Simone and I decided at a certain point that we wanted to focus on information design. So it's not only interaction design all around, but really working with information. And we sort of like built our own small company within the company. And so we tried to start to find our own clients. And that was something that was agreed with the partners, of course, because the information design part was sort of like a new, uh, tiny branch. And then we figured that we were, you know, pretty good at doing that. So also to find clients and to manage a small team. We were just like four people. And after that, uh, we sort of said that naturally we wanted to build our own company. And then like for another occasion, like another person that we knew that is now our third partner, um, he was heavy, he, yeah, he was working on one of his own previous company. He was doing motion graphics and videos and he was good at making the business part, but he wasn't interested anymore in the video output. And then we just started to try to see if we wanted to, you know, do something together. But the specific occasion for building the company was one of those things that always happened. So there was an RFP, a big RFP that somebody like, sent our ways and we were like, why we just don't try? We tried, we won the RFP and then we had to build a company because <laughs> otherwise they couldn't, you know, hire us as professionals and single professional. And um, we started in three with two other designers and now we are 22. I'm not, we didn't really plan in the beginning to become that big. I mean, I know it's small, but for being a design company, I think, I mean, to me now it feels big, but, um, I guess that like the data visualization market is very full of opportunities now. And so we've gotten so many requests 
from very different kind of clients and we also try to build our way to be in a way a little recognized for what we do because we published so we did projects for visibility and then I went on speaking at conferences and so it's not only that they are kind of like you know uh, calling guys but you also like actively have to promote your work promote yourself even if this is something that some designers don't really like to do so it, I think it was both like a coincidence of people that were interested in the same topics in the same moment and also the fact that then when we started the company we realized that there was there was an opportunity to build a company and not only a tiny design studio. I don't know if you have more specific question on that. I, yeah. No, that answers my question. Okay, thanks. I, I do, yeah. Thanks for coming. Very, uh, very fascinating talk. Thanks. Uh, I guess I have two questions too. Mm -hmm. um, one is, uh, we had a studio visit last week, and their big mantra seemed to be um, like breaking free of the screens and the constraint of like screens and the two mm. dimensions that you know data visualization traffics in. Yeah. And I was wondering if you felt constrained by that, and then not to put the tool ahead of like the context, but mm -hmm. like, are you interested in other ways of uh, you know, exhibiting this data, like either sonification or virtual reality. Yeah. And then my second question was like, uh, what do you think are the most uh, valuable tools for a designer to have in her tool set? Okay, um, I think the first question, um, it always depends on the goals. When we work with data with our clients, we like 99% of the time have we are required to build something that is specifically a web tool, a mobile tool. So something that, I mean, they already dictate the fact that they will be using that tool in this way. And so we are somehow constrained by the B-dimensionality. I think that there are a lot of opportunities for sure to work on other kind of ways to represent data, maybe as you said, in a, in a sonic way or like with VR also. But what I'm feeling is that most of the market is not ready yet. So maybe there are definitely possibility to do artistic exploration and I think there have been some very interesting artistic exploration on how you can yeah, merge VR with data or also you can use sounds for representing data. It's just that as always all of this kind of like avant-garde has to be digested before being really used. So what I'm saying is like I've never had any clients or any request for doing something different than B-dimensional data visualization with data. Um, the second question is about the tools. Again, uh, it depends on how on what you want to do. Like all of the visualization that you saw in the first part of the presentation, so the data visualization for La Lettura, we've been doing that with Excel and Illustrator. So really nothing more. It was for sure more labor intensive, uh, like slower than if we would have had a web developer back then. But it's sort of like also set up our method is like I myself, I don't code. I will never learn how to code because I mean, it just doesn't make sense because I have developers, but I still can work with data. And uh, so I, I, I guess what I'm saying is like from the basic pencil and paper to Excel and Illustrator and to then like maybe having something that helps you draft um, visuals before you refine them. For example, Tableau is an interesting tool because more and more it allows you to like also have multiple and inter, inter, interactive views on a dashboard and it's not 100% intuitive as it can be, I don't know, uh, a word document, a word program, but it's still something that we found some of our clients being able to learn how to use. And then, of course, it depends on how much you want to go deep into coding. So, I don't know, what, what do you mean exactly by tools? Do you mean like technological tools or maybe? Um, yeah, I mean, like you mentioned Hadoop or, you know, G3 or like whatever, like JavaScript. Yeah, our developers work like doing everything custom. They use these three libraries sometimes, but they just really work on, I mean, they're just amazing. I don't know how they do. Yeah. Well, Georgia, I'm sure some people want to speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, yeah. How proud we are to have you here today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.